All right, so welcome everybody to our ninth seminar in the Algebra, Particles, and Quantum Theory Seminar Series. I'm pleased to introduce you to tonight's speakers, Tevin Dre and Corinne Minogue. Corinne and Tevin are professors at Oregon State University in the departments of physics and mathematics, respectively. They're also both APS fellows. Corinne received her PhD at the University of Texas and then went on to become a member at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, um, a postdoc at the University of Durham, and an Indo-American fellow at both the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Madras and the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Bombay. Tevian uh, received his PhD at UC Berkeley, also followed by membership at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, a postdoc at Freie Universität in Berlin, a postdoc in Utrecht with Gerard Tehuft, and a postdoc at the University of York, and also an Indo-American fellowship at both the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Madras and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. If you pull up their CVs, you will find an extensive list of awards which demonstrates how uh, dedicated to physics and mathematics education both Corinne and Tevian have been throughout their careers. This includes initiating the Paradigms in Physics project for which Corinne is the principal investigator. Tevian and Corinne have, actively, have been actively working on the octonions longer than any of us. They are world experts on this topic and even wrote a book not long ago called Geometry of the Octonions. So tonight they will be telling us about a division algebraic construction of the magic square with the purpose of preparing us for their next talk where they will use these tools to tell us about some new results they have relating the standard model to E8. Now, before we begin, I would like to emphasize that everybody who showed up here today is here to learn. And so I hope that everyone feels comfortable enough to raise their hand and ask a question throughout the talk if they have one. If you accidentally ask a silly question, it's not a big deal. You just brush yourself off and try again next time. I would especially like to encourage questions from graduate students, upper level undergraduates and postdocs. Okay, so Tevi, and anytime you're ready. All right, thank you, Cole. Let me first of all build on what you just said. Thank you for the kind introduction and invitation, and especially for creating this space, this shared space for us all to be able to communicate on these topics. I also want to emphasize that I would welcome comments, questions, both during and of course after the talk. Please feel free to interrupt. Cole, I'll ask you to moderate that a little bit if necessary. Um, I may not see if people raise their hands and things like that. No problem. Um, the talk that I'm about to give, mostly me today, followed by mostly Corinne in two weeks, um, presents first the mathematical framework for um, a, a description of E8, followed by a, an attempt to use it to describe some physics. Um, as Cole has said, these are things that we've been working on for many, many years. Um, let me first start, of course, the remote just died. All right. None of the technology is working. We will do it manually. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, so first of all, the long list of, of folks to thank. First and foremost, Rob Wilson, who is a collaborator, a full collaborator on this project. The work that I'll be talking about today is mostly the mathematical piece. I hope he will recognize it because it's not quite in the language he wrote down. But this description of E8 most definitely is due to, to his insights and longstanding work in finite groups, which he has been sharing with us now for many years um, in an application to league groups. And let me um, point out that I also thank him for his patience. The, the E8 paper um, on which this work is based, which was just released, um, was basically completed in 2014. David Fairley and Tony Sudbury, I'm not going to go through this whole list, but David Fairley and Tony Sudbury deserve special mention here. Um, as Corinne had mentioned in just before we started, um, she had the opportunity to work with both of them as postdocs, and she's the one who, who brought me into the Octonians later on, a long list of students, a couple of other collaborators, and last but not least, FQXI, the John Templeton Foundation Institute for Advanced Study for financial support along the way. 
Cole, um, you have the URLs for the two papers. I don't see a chat window here. If you have a way to share it with the participants, please feel free to go ahead. Um, two papers are about to show up in the archive. They were submitted early this morning, um, but they won't be there just yet. Um, Cole, if that doesn't work, you'll be able to find them in a day or two. So let me review some things that are likely uh, well known to much of this audience. First of all, the division algebras, you start with the real numbers, add an imaginary unit to get the complex numbers, do it again to get the quaternions, and do it again to get the octonians. Um, sorry, this is really not working. Do it again to get the uh, octonians. And those are the standard division algebras that many of you will be familiar with. Somewhat less familiar are the split octonians, where you basically go through the same process, but the last unit that you add is not complex. It's a hyperbolic unit. It squares to plus one instead of minus one. But the Cayley-Dixon process used to get here is the same. The geometry is quite different. The algebra is significantly different. There's no nice Fano um, geometry. to So this triangle on the right to represent the multiplication table of the ordinary octonians, there's no similar picture for the split octonians, but you can work out the multiplication table knowing um, that of the quaternions and knowing um, that uh, capital L squares to plus one. We're going to be using both. We will introduce a preferred basis using lowercase letters for O, uppercase letters for O prime, and distinguishing between the units where necessary by calling the unit for O prime U. And again, I apologize about the technology. I do not have the anticipated ability to write on these slides. Um, so, so I can't point easily to what I'm talking about. Some special properties of the split division algebras, the split octonians have signature for four. So this gives us an opportunity to talk about non-compact groups. We have things that square to plus one, things that square to minus one. The, there are null elements. Just one second. Sorry for the interruption. There are null elements that square to zero. There are there's zero divisors, and that leads to there being projections. All of these properties will show up both in the mathematics in a little while and later in the physics. Let me jump right to the main topic today, which is to talk about the Freudenthal Tietz magic square of Lie algebras discovered in the 1960s, which parameterizes a series of Lie algebras in terms of two division algebras. And the one that we all care about is in the lower right corner, the exceptional Lie algebra E8, which requires two copies of the octonians. Again, I don't want to spend um, time going through all of the history, but there was a very nice description that Vinberg gave more or less at the same time involving that is symmetric, that uses the two division algebras in a symmetric way, unlike the original descriptions of Freudenthal and Tietz. And then a long list um, of work, much of which we've been a part of trying to uh, bootstrap these descriptions of Lie algebras up into a nice description of the finite groups. But let me give you a series of guiding principles interspersed throughout this talk. We are going to take the position that Lie algebras are real. 
we are not going to, in the traditional sense, we are not going to complexify our Lie algebras. The signature matters. And in particular, that allows us to talk about groups like the Lorentz group with boosts and rotations, rather than immediately jumping to a complexified Lie algebra SO4 that of course includes SO31 as a real slice. When you do that, the magic square has a, there are actually three magic squares. You can put in two division algebras, two split division algebras, or use what we call the half split magic square, where we put in one division algebra K and one split division algebra K prime, and you get the particular real forms shown in this table. The remarkable thing about the magic square, of course, is that it directly contains four of the five exceptional Lie algebras, the E's and the F's, and it also implicitly has um, G2, the fifth exceptional Lie algebra in it. Okay. Barton and Sudbury in 2003, I believe were the first to comment explicitly that there is a magic, a smaller magic square with the same structure. We refer to these as two by two and three by three magic squares because our goal has been all along to interpret these in line with this Vinberg description as algebras of anti-Hermitian matrices over the division algebras. For the two by two magic square, that program works very nicely. Um, in work nearly a decade ago now, um, Joshua Kincaid and John Huerta and I uh, took this picture and showed how to describe the entire two by two magic square using um, Clifford algebras. Uh, resulting in, a, in a, a, both a finite and an infinitesimal description. And let me tell you a little bit of what that looks like. I'd like to focus on one of the most interesting algebras in the two by two square, which is the Lorentz group SO31. But of course, I can't say group now because I'm talking about Lie algebras. This entire talk will emphasize the Lie algebra structure, but the framework that we're giving lends itself very easily to conversion to a direct analysis of the groups. It is as usual easier to write it down in terms of the algebra. And so that's what I'm doing today. As was pointed out in the 80s, starting with the work of Evans and Corrigan, and followed up by that work that Corinne did as a postdoc together with David Fairley and Tony Sudbury, and later built on by Corinne's graduate student, Jörg Schrei and herself. This, if you look at that second row in this magic square, you see the Lorentz groups in three, four, six, and 10 dimensions. That immediately catches people's eyes. Oh, this must have something to do with super string theory. Um, and, and supersymmetry, and indeed, you can make certain connections of those dimensions and the division algebras are connected as has been followed up, as has been pursued by a number of authors in the time since. But let me focus on SO31. This will show you where we're going. It's well known that you can write SO31 as SL2C, which means the action on vectors is an MX M dagger, or in this case, I've written it as MP M dagger um, um, operation, where the vector P is replaced by this two by two Hermitian matrix. At the algebra level, that gives you something um, that's a little bit hard to categorize, to classify, because depending on whether you look at the rotations or the boosts in SO31, the matrices are either Hermitian or anti-Hermitian. And so the infinitesimal action is either a commutator or an anti-commutator. 
Everything can be written in a Clifford algebra language using Pauli matrices, as I've attempted to show here. So what we're going to do to this structure is change it from looking at an element in this funny complex space. I say funny because I've been looking at the other one for so long that acts that where you act with SL2C. Instead, we're going to stick that vector into C prime. Uh, in fact, sum, direct sum C. You can we're going to put in both complex numbers and split complex numbers. The T and the Z components become elements of the split complex numbers, but nothing else changes. You've just stuck in some factors of capital L. Capital L squares to one, you never see it. So this is entirely a copy of what you're used to. It's just written in this new weird um, split division algebra language. The amazing thing that happens when you do that is that, of course, the boosts now all have L's in them. L is itself an anti-Hermitian um, element, an imaginary element of the division algebra. And so the entire algebra has become an algebra of anti-Hermitian matrices. And what we've just demonstrated is that SL2C and SO31 are also the same thing as SU2C prime tensor C. So I could almost stop the talk there. The entire two by two magic square is obtained by replacing C and C prime by your favorite division algebras. And the entire three by three magic square is obtained by replacing two by three. And that's really the meat of what this talk is about. But I'm going to try and show you a more practical um, interpretation of those results. So here's the two by two magic split. The algebras are just the matrices in SU2 K prime tensor K. I can generate that algebra by the matrices I've called D and X in blue in about the third or fourth line. And if you think about it, the Ds are diagonal and won't mix K and K prime. The Xs are off diagonal and will mix K and K prime. And so the idea there in green is that we're acting on for the octonianic case, a 16 dimensional space, one element in O, one element in O prime. And the Ds are doing rotations between the one direction and say the I direction or the U direction and the L direction, but always in the same octonianic space. Whereas the Xs are mixing up an element from O with an element from O prime. Now the hard work is that that doesn't yet cover the entire algebra. You still have to implement what we call the transverse rotations, the ones between imaginary elements of O or O prime. You can implement those by nested multiplication. Any ij rotation can be realized as a one i rotation followed by a one j rotation. So, the, the, so we need to make the commutators of, as is shown in the bottom right, a di and a dj, that one i and one j rotation in order to get the remaining elements. And the brilliant step taken by Rob in analyzing E8 when we get there, is to give that composition the name, allowing us to write this nesting in matrix form. As long as we stop with the quaternions, there's no problem. You can use nesting and multiply everything out, just have iterated operations. But when we get up to the, sorry, as long as we, I said that badly. 
as long as we are acting on some representation, we can use nested multiplication of these matrices. But when we want to start talking in a few minutes about the adjoint representation, we need a name for these elements. And what Rob showed is that there is a consistent way of labeling these objects using um, a notation that is equivalent to us writing di comma j, what we call the two index d's, the double index d's, in terms of an operation which is written as composition. Okay. Here's the three by three magic square. In its half split form, the Lie algebra structure is well known, but the algebras in the right hand column are traditionally written as exceptional algebras, and the algebras in the bottom row, the octonionic row and column, are normally written as just some exceptional algebra with some signature. What we showed a, a, a roughly a decade ago was first how to interpret the right-hand column as a generalization of those Lorentz groups. That goes back to the work of Minogue and Try that in the two by two square, that second row was all Lorentz groups, SO21, SO31, SO51, SO91, written, however, as SL2R, SL2C, SL2H, and SL2O. So first what we did was extend that interpretation to the three by three picture using E6 in this signature acting on Jordan algebras to give a good interpretation of that real form of E6, the group as SL3O and along the way F4 as SU3O. And then later together with Rob to extend the work of Barton and Sudbury to a group description of the third row as symplectic groups, where there are some subtleties because there's half a dozen definitions of symplectic in the literature, and we had to pick one very carefully. But the fourth row was always a mystery. What family of groups goes in the fourth row? And of course, the answer in hindsight is obvious. The only thing that can possibly go in the fourth row is a description that accommodates E8 sitting in that last spot. The minimal representation of E8 is the adjoint representation. And so the fourth row, if it's going to be unified, has got to be all adjoints. And so we switched gears roughly 10 years ago to trying to understand adjoint E8, rather than, as before, something like E6 acting on Jordan algebras. So guiding principle number two is that the three by three magic square contains the two by two magic square, of course, and that that is a non-trivial statement that every time you look at a three by three Lie algebra, an algebra in the Freudenthal Tietz magic square, you want to always separate it into its two by two bits, which is why I spend so much time on the two by two magic square, and its remaining bits, okay? So let me show you how that works. In our old viewpoint, we would have curly Ms representing elements of, say, SO91, a Lorentz group, acting on curly Ps, say, an element of a Jordan algebra. And the action would be given as P goes to MP M dagger. This is standard action of E6 on a Jordan algebra. But if you take curly Ms, not in all of, e, of, of um, E6, but if you look at the two by two preferred with a choice of splitting, 
preferred SL91, you get an action both on vectors P and on spinners theta at the same time. And so an idea that goes way back to our work on E6 is that the three by three structure should be broken to a two by two or a two plus one structure. But if you look at this picture, remember what I told you a few minutes ago, when looking at SO31, by sticking in split complex numbers, by sticking in the split division algebras, the MX M dagger operation here, MP M dagger is always about anti-Hermitian matrices. And so there's no real difference between the picture you're seeing now and the same picture in the adjoint representation, where now P is again in not the Jordan algebra, but in E6, or of course E7 or E8. The action at the Lie algebra level is still the commutator, but now we have simultaneously the SO91Ms, if I'm doing the E6 example, acting on SO91Ps in the adjoint action, but still acting on the thetas in a spinner action. Okay? So that's guiding principle number two. Well, that's really getting to the gist of what we want to do. Here's the three by three magic square in a nutshell. Let's try and spend some time on this slide. But here's the three by three magic square in a nutshell. The algebras are all SU3 K prime tensor K. We can think of them as matrices. We will write those matrices in a form that respects the two plus one splitting. So we have Ds and Xs as before, just embedded into the three by three setting. But those Ds and Xs are preferentially acting on the two by two bits in the adjoint representation and the sort of third bit in a spinner representation. And of course, we'd better add a basis for those spinners, the Ys and Zs here for the extra two pieces. And of course, we need the double index Ds. But if you now count, we're done. And the reason is that over the octonians, triality ensures that these diagonal matrices, and in particular, the double index Ds, have multiple representations in E8. Roughly speaking, I can rearrange Dij, the last matrix there. I can use the other type structure, we call it, where I put the two and where I put the one in the two plus one decomposition. But no matter how I do it, there's only one copy of SO8 here because of triality. And so the SO8 elements can all be written in terms of the Ds as shown, both the single index Ds and the double index Ds, okay? So the matrices shown here suffice to span, in fact, all of E8 over the octonians. Some of them have other representations, sort of a Gelman-like lambda eight, the S matrix shown in the, the top row is a very useful representation that we use frequently, but it is equivalent to a particular combination of those double index Ds. So we don't need both, although it's convenient to replace some of the double index Ds by Ss. More precisely, we only actually need the double index Ds to represent elements 
of the two G2s, G2 for O and G2 prime for O prime, and the other elements of SO7 or SO34, the remaining 14, seven plus seven elements of those two Lie algebras could instead have been expressed as S's. But that's just a counting argument. Let me go back to something that I don't think I emphasized, which was that those Ds and Xs, I told you what they rotated. I'm sorry that I can't circle things here, but in the green line in the middle, all elements of E8, as with clearly all elements of the two by two magic square in the basis that we're using have really two indices. We've written di, but of course we could have written one times i. It's a rotation in the one i plane. So all of those single index objects, the second index is either one or u which is hidden because you can multiply it out. But if you think of the basis elements as labeled that way, all we're doing is spanning SO12-4 for the O prime plus O case with the 120 rotations, pick an element in O, pick an element in O prime, you need a rotation in every plane, and we've chosen to write some of them as Ds and some of them as Xs. And that of course also tells you how to work out all the commutators because you know what the commutator of say, angular momentum LX and LY are. You know how rotations commute with each other. Yes, you have to be careful to make sure with the boosts that you get all the signs right, but that's a detail. All right, back to where I was. In this picture, all we've done is we've added to that description of SO124, 120 elements for the octonians. All we've done is add a bunch of Ys and Zs that are also two index objects, P and Q, I'm sorry, they're both Ps here. The two Ps are each elements of K prime tensor K. So there are in fact 64 Ys and 64 Zs making up the 128 elements that we need to add to SO12-4 to get E8. All right. I'm a mathematician. Rob is even more of a mathematician. Corinne is a physicist. For a decade, I've been trying to listen to what the two of them tell me and translate so that the three of us can communicate, okay? But as a physicist would tell you, half the battle is picking the right notation. We propose a nota this notation, not a notation, this notation, as best capturing the mathematical structure of all the elements in the magic square. And we're now going to switch and talk only about E8. Someone should have commented that triality, of course, only holds when I get to the octonians. So what do I do? if I want to talk about the H prime H spot in the magic square, well, that's easy. I'll embed it in the octonians and use the triality justified octonionic labels if necessary. Okay, that's a good place to pause for a moment for questions. Okay, here we go. So uh, please go ahead, Tijinder. Yeah, uh, hi, hi, Tavian. Uh, just a quick uh, elementary question. So we can think of F4 
as the automorphism group of the exceptional Jordan algebra, E6 of the complexified exceptional Jordan algebra. Is there something like that for E8? I'll say maybe. Um, there was the work um, a, a number of years ago trying, uh, now I'm sorry, the name slips my mind, um, showing that all of the exceptional E algebras could be written as symmetry groups of bigger and bigger structures of that form. I'm pretty sure John Baez concluded that that wasn't quite right for E7 and E8, and we've never checked. The short answer is that is not the interpretation we're going to use, and so I don't know the actual answer. So suppose I ask for a definition of E8, how would you define it? It's SU3 O prime tensor O. It's defined on this slide if you're asking me. Perfect, okay, great, thank you, thank you. Yes, that, that's good, yes. Okay, and again, the hard work that goes into the, the first of our papers, the hard work is showing that this description not only closes that it is a Lie algebra and that it is in fact isomorphic to standard treatments of E8. But if you're asking me in retrospect, I'll say, no, 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 start here. So that's SU, not a good, so that's SU3, not a, okay, sorry, go on, please, go on. I was just gonna say that's not a great math answer, but it's a wonderful physics answer. So like SU3 with, let's say, bioctonions. Uh, I can call O plus O prime a bioctonion? They're probably not, but I've never sorted out all of the terminology on some of the different names. Okay, please go o, ahead. o prime tensor O. Okay, please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, wait, can so, I can I jump in oh, to Jindra? Yep. Um, we spent a you know a long a lot of time a long time ago trying to think of E six acting on Jordan algebra, the exceptional Jordan algebra. Mm -hmm. Um. And so when we were doing that work, we were thinking of the action of the group or the algebra on some other space. Mm -hmm. And what, what has happened here is that when you go to E8, you can think of the things that are doing the acting and the things that are being acted on, both being in adjoint E8. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so this thinking of something as the automorphism group of something else, you know, is, is is kind of assuming that the, the two things that you're talking about are in different spaces. And mm -hmm. here, the, the real unification comes from, from that, that everything being in adjoint E8. Okay, thank you. Good, John. Oh, hello. Um, hi, good to see you, Tevin. Hey, John, great to see you. Yeah, and Cole and Corinne, of course. Great to see you. Um, just a just a little question, actually. Uh, so I think you were counting 128 of something like x and y's, or yes, y's and z's. But y's yes. and z's. Okay. So, but the so does that mean that they span like a spinner representation? Yes. Yeah, so that's the next slide. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. That's that was it actually. Fine. No, that's absolutely the next slide. Okay. Cool. Um, and it's also actually the previous slide. Um, sorry, lost my mouse. And maybe I have the ability to write again in the meantime. That's the, that's this slide, which is that this two plus one decomposition will give us our adjoint and spinner actions at the same time. And precisely in the O prime tensor O case, as you'll see in a moment on the next slide, what we've done is write E8 as SO124 plus a spinner representation. And maybe it's time to go on and show that next slide. Um, nope, uh, but yes, so that's basically here. So the two plus one decomposition, as I just said, there it is on the slide, the two by two part will be the bottom right element in the two by two magic square. That's SO124. Those are the X's and D's. And as I pointed out a moment ago, 
you can think of those X's and D's as all being labeled by the two indices, the two labels of the 16 O and O prime labels. And so you have 120 rotations and boosts in SO12-4 in that collection of D's and X's, okay? Um, but the spinner action is now act with SO12-4 on the Y's and Z's. And the Y's and Z's can be identified with the upper right two by one block, each with 64 degrees of freedom, okay? And so I can think of a spinner as being a two component column directly in O prime tensor O, and I can act now easily with SO12-4 using ordinary matrix, possibly nested matrix multiplication, and the commutators implement exactly that multiplication. The spinner part is easy. It's the adjoint part that's hard because you have what amounts to nested matrices acting on nested matrices. Okay. So what have we got so far? All algebras in both magic squares are subalgebras of E8. And we just told you how to build E8. So anytime I've got an algebra in E8, in, in either magic square, I can drop it into E8 and see what the E8 action does to E8, all of E8, which splits into SO12-4 plus a spinner wrap, okay? That spinner rep is in fact a single Majorana vial spinner of SO12-4. And therefore, this single Majorana vial spinner automatically contains spinner reps of your favorite two by two subalgebra of SO12-4. Anything you can put into SO12-4, E8 tells you how it acts on spinners, okay? So let's now give you the final principle and then I'm gonna turn it over to Corinne to give you a preview of the physics portion of the talk, which will be in two weeks. Everything lives in E8. The adjoints, the spinners, and whatever pieces we get when we break SO12-4 into smaller adjoints. E8 is all there is. Let's study how it acts on itself and what those actions mean for all of the smaller pieces. Corinne. Yeah, so pull up the next piece, please. So what Tevian has done is shown you how E8 um, breaks into SO12-4 plus this Majorana vial spinner rep of single Majorana vial spinner rep of SO12-4. And now for all of you who have been busy um, doing um, guts and standard model things, you immediately want to break up SO12-4 um, into um, various subgroups. And because we've chosen this particular O prime tensor O um, version of E8, we have both boosts and rotations. So I will point out that there are three versions of E8. You can do it the com totally compact version in O tensor O, but that one of course has no boosts, but you can do the half split one that we will talk about here or the one in O prime tensor O, which we call double split. And we spent a lot of time trying to decide which of those two we wanted to use to do physics. 
but because of the guiding principle number, I don't, I think it was number one, that we're only using the real Lie algebras, um, you really have to take the signatures of, as you split this SO124, you have to take the signatures seriously. So the first thing we do is split SO124 into the Lorentz SO31 that we want. And then an SO, we'd like an SO10 to be able to do a, a standard gut, but you don't get an SO10, you get either an SO91 or something. We are choosing to split it into SO73 and SO2. The extra SO2 that we have will then act as a complex structure on the spinner sector so that we can have complexified Lie algebras when they're acting on spinners. Um, so we have Lorentz SO31, we have an, a, an SO10 for the gut with a funny signature to it and a complex structure. When we break up the SO73 as a gut, we break it up into a, a, a weak SO4 and then the color sector is SO33. That signature is forced on us. Um, and then you can further break the SO4 into SU2 left and SU2 right. Um, you get an SU3 color, but it's really an SL3R. Um, and when you break that, the SO33 into an, the SU3 color, there's an extra U1 there. And so the full splitting of SO124 is given by this bottom line. We'll have a Lorentz SO31, we'll have an SU2 left and right, we'll have a color uh, SU3 and the U1 of electromagnetism and an SO2 for the complex structure. So all of those things are living in SO124. They all act on the spinners. Um, and so next week we'll show you how to make particles and antiparticles. Um, and, and they're killing duels out of those things. Um, and we will further show you that when you break up the SO124 into these little Lie algebras, you get a lot of leftover things, um, which we are also trying to identify as um, bosons in the standard model. Do you wanna go on to the next slide, Tevin, please? So the summary is that treat the Lie algebras as real, as over the reals, the break the three by three structure into a two by two and the extra stuff, the extra stuff is spinners. All the representations live in this real E8. E8 is SO124 plus this spinner rep and then the SO124 breaks naturally into what you want for Lorentz and the standard model and, and an extra complex structure. And that will be the topic for next, next talk. Thank you. We are done. Did you wanna say anything more? No, um, I don't think so. I did, as you saw, finally recover the ability to write. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Corinne and Tevian for such a wonderful talk. Um, does anybody have any more questions? So I have a uh, quick one. So can you uh, can you remind me again? Um, what was the dimension of the spinner space that's uh, left over um, after this SO twelve four is taken out? Uh, so it's one hundred and twenty eight. It's a it's a okay. Meyer on a vial spinner. Let me get back to it if I can. Okay. Um, sorry. So do you there do that? In... Okay. So it's it's one. It's a it's a it's a it's a Meyer on a vial spinner of SO twelve four. It's okay. a vial spinner of SO104. Two vials. Okay. No. Oh, one. It's so this a is single one, vial spinner. Single vial. Of SO <clears throat> so it's 128 real. 128 yes. real, real, 64 okay. complex. Okay, so do, do you view this as, as one, do you view it as one generation or like one generation plus its antiparticles or? Yes. So okay. if you, so this is, Corinne, I don't know how much you want to say at this point. The, the paper's I, out there, you can say anything. The paper's out there, okay. okay. <laughs> so if you take, if you look at things as representations of SO91, yeah. so SO91 will have the complex structure SO2, 
-hmm. and it will have the Lorentz group, SO31, right. and it will have a electroweak SO4, but not color. So let's look there for the moment, okay? If you th think of things as, as representations of SO91, these spinners will divide exactly in half, okay? And so the 128 splits into 264s right. um, because of that. Um, you will see next time that we are going to write down a Dirac equation. We will solve that Dirac equation. And what you'll find is particles on one side, antiparticles on the other, but also duals of each of those things on the wrong side. There's some interesting counting that happens. And I think, so, I, go ahead. Let, let me say in short, uh, Cole, it's you get one generation of particles and antiparticles and their killing duels, which you need to be able to make scalars. Okay. Okay. Um, were there, um... I'm tempted to ask a, another question, which I suspect you might be, you might answer next time, but um, are there any hints about three generations? Yes, yes, we propose a mechanism to provide three generations. I don't want to go into it here. Um, it is in the paper, it is going to be out there, um, but let, let Corinne talk about that in two okay. weeks. Well, yeah, I, let's, I, let's not spoil the surprise, I guess. So they, well, it's in the paper, so, yep. but they sit on, the three generations sit on top of each other in a okay. really beautiful way. Okay. I, I suspect I might know what you're going to say, but I'll, I'll wait till next time. Um, no, so to, to Ginger and John, you, um, you both have your hands up and I don't know if it's from your questions before or if it's if you have new questions. So to David Ginger, Jackson had his hand up at some point, but it's come down. Okay. So um, I'm just going to unmute you to Ginger. Do you have a question to Ginger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Savian. That was really beautiful. I'll go back and try to digest it. Many, many questions, but uh, uh, maybe just one uh, little uh, in the different, because uh, you and Corinne have worked very extensively also on the exceptional Jordan algebra, and you also talked about its cubic characteristic equation, which you know I've been quite excited about, and I claim that that has some indicators for the values of the free parameters of the standard model. Would you be seeing a relationship between what you are doing now and the exceptional Jordan algebra and the characteristic equation? What is so your view the, on the, yeah. the beautiful thing about E8 is that it does everything. So it's not merely that you can split E8 up into um, SO124 and spinners, but you can split E8 up into your, into your favorite other exceptional algebra. Mm -hmm. If you want to do Jordan algebras, you split up E8 into E6. Mm -hmm. E6 is centralized by SU3, mm -hmm. okay? But you also get representations of SU3 and E6. What are those representations? They're Jordan algebras. Mm -hmm. So anything you can do with exceptional Jordan algebras, I can do using the adjoint representation of E8. Nice, nice, yes, thank you. Okay. So almost you, certainly, Tajindra, you can embed what you do in, into this. Great, that's fantastic. It's really beautiful, I, I appreciate it. Uh, so now uh, my another question is, uh, what about, you have the Lorentz symmetry coming in, SO31, but what about gravity? So let us say that our collaboration has different views on that point. Um, I don't want to speak in particular for Rob, um, but Corinne and I feel reasonably strongly that this is a special relativistic model and that there's, that there's just room for special relativity and the standard, or let me phrase for special for general for special relativity, and what is very much akin to an SO10 gut, okay. Yeah. But one could imagine putting a structure like this um, into some sort of fiber bundle over space time. 
What is SU two R doing physics wise? What is SU two R doing? SU two L I think of as a weak force. What do I do with SU two R? You have uh, SU two R also, no? In again, it's part of SU two. Regard. I mean, I can give you the standard gut answer. In SU five, you need part of it to make hypercharge. We have some ideas about mediators and finding them in the remaining bits. And again, Corinne will talk about uh, those in a couple of weeks. Just mention what I did, you know. Uh, I used SU2R to get a left-right symmetric extension of the standard model, which now has right-handed sterile neutrinos. And I actually interpret SU2R as a thicker chiral gravity, you know. Uh, and it actually, SU2R helps to bring in uh, general relativity. So a good question, I'm going to steer the conversation in a slightly different direction. A good question to ask um, is about the chirality of the resulting theory. Yes. And uh, we've recently become aware of a paper that Cole wrote, um, which, which possibly addresses this issue, but we do have both SU2 left and SU2 right. And in that sense, it's an SO10 like theory. But because of the division algebra structure, they come in in different ways. Mm -hmm. oh, and so we would like to pursue the question of chirality. I have to say that we don't see, the two of us don't see a mechanism for going directly to gravity. Um, but I encourage you to discuss that perhaps with our, our, our close collaborator, Rob Wilson. Okay, so it yeah, looks like John, uh, John Huerta, sorry, John Huerta has a question. Uh, Tijin, you know, I want to give John a, a chance here. I think he's waiting. Yeah, yeah, please, okay, please. okay, thanks. Okay, John, John go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks, for the, thanks for the talk, that was really great. Um, can I, so, I, I've got a couple of questions, but let me first just ask. Um, so, where's what's where's the group E eight? Like, how are you getting your hands on that? So, I thought, so I'm still showing you these slides, which I had forgotten about. But let me. I've E eight is buried in the fact that I can exponentiate these matrices. Okay. I okay. Yeah. And so anything I can, and, and because, and in fact, John, you know this better than anyone else here because of the work we did together when we took the, the Clifford algebra description and talked about how to exponentiate that when nested. Sure. It's the same idea with the single very big catch that you have to think carefully about what you mean when acting acting on the elements of the adjoint E8 that are quote unquote nested. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I've, I'm hiding that mathematical structure, but this is the, 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 the single biggest piece of the work in our view um, th that Rob did in, in generating this description of the eight is that you can exponentiate it in this language. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, I'm really curious to see the details, but that's a, that's a good answer for now. One more small question. Oh, I, actually, I think this is related. So uh, chatting with Jens Kupliger, who's also here, uh, he points out that the octo-octonians are not power associative. So he's worried about like um, when you're nesting more than uh, like two or three things, what happens? So there's actually an easy answer to that question. But before I get there, um, if, if Rob, if you're still here, do you want to address John's question further? I can find Rob Wilson. Oh, there he is here. So Rob, um, go ahead. Not the not this one, the one about exponentiating about the group. Um, oh, um, 
to be honest, I can't remember uh, how it works. You were just <laughs> asking about the description of E8, the group, which we've been, we haven't said much about. If you had anything you wanted to say about E8, the group, as opposed to the Lie algebra, I wanted to give you a chance. Uh, I don't think I've got anything to say about that, really. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. John, to come back to your question, um, order is not a problem in the following sense. We will work in the enveloping algebra of E8. In the enveloping algebra, everything is associative because you always work from the inside out. Right, okay, sure. And, and our primary focus again is not in trying to define, say, a complexified version of the color group acting on E8. It's enough to be able to do those things acting on spinners inside of E8, and that makes things much easier. Okay. Okay, cool. And then I had one, I had a little question for Corinne, um, which is that you mentioned that you worked on quantum gravity before you got, uh, before you, the Octonians attracted your interest. And I was just wondering what flavor of quantum gravity you're working on. I, I did field theory in curved space. Oh, okay, yeah. So it, it was around the, the, you know, the Hawking radiation stuff. So oh, I yeah. looked at things like rotating space times and um, signature change space times and simple models like that. Um, but I haven't done that work in 30 years. So this is actually how Corinne and I met because we had independently done some work on quantum field theory and curved space and started started trying to collaborate. Right. Okay, very cool. Okay. Do you have another question, John? No, no, you should, you should uh, move on to the next. Okay. All right, so the next person is uh, David Jackson. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Carl, very much. And thank you for this very nice um, talk. Um, so, uh, Tavion, you mentioned um, in the second row of the three by three um, magic square, uh, how this e e e e E6 action on the Jordan algebra, um, that has the property of preserving a determinant that can be defined, the three by three cubic determinant. Yes. Is yes. there any analogy of that for the um, E8? I'm, so I'm going to say yes, and you're going to smile when I do, because we spent years trying to work our way up from E6 acting on Jordan algebras, preserving a determinant, to E7 acting on what we now call Freudenthal towers, um, preserving a cortic right. invariant, to E8 doing we could never figure out what. And right. we finally realized that we were looking in the wrong place. There is a natural product that is preserved for any Lie algebra, and that's the killing form. Okay. And so the, the invariance that we need, the invariance that we use, the inner product that we use, even to determine what is a boost, what is a rotation, okay? Um, and in particular, what is invariant under what, and ultimately to construct a Hermitian inner product, that's all built into E8 through the killing form. Okay. So the only invariant product we care about is actually the killing form. I, I, I right. no, I want to disagree with Tevian. <laughs> I, I agree with what he said about the killing form, but I think I still don't know whether there isn't some other invariant that is the thing we need to build. We don't have an action yet in E8. Right. And whether Tevian thinks he can do it with just the killing form, I think we need another a good idea. So I don't, we, but we don't know the answer to your question of whether there is something else besides the killing form. Well, I'm thinking in particular, a few years ago, there were papers on the optic um, E8 invariant involving various Casimir operators in different dimensions. So is it kind of an eighth order? Um, oh, that would so be- So I was, a, I was about to- Can you point us to those papers? Sorry? Can you uh, point well, us to those? Uh, well, one paper just called the, the optic uh, or the- Optic E8 invariant. I forget the authors. I can't pronounce the authors' names, but the Optic E8 invariant. I think 2007. 
Is it Cedarvall okay. and Palmquist or something like that? Cedarvall, that okay. So I was about to say that, of course, you can play around with the Casimirs, and it sounds like that's right. what these people have that what these people have done. Um, right. Given that the E seven invariant is already cortic, right? We were we we kind of abandoned that approach, but right. the short answer is we don't know, and it could well be that there is a higher order expression. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. So okay. let me let me let me come back to Corinne's comment about the action. If you think about the action. The action has two spinners, right, and a mediator, and perhaps some other stuff coupling. So it you could try and imagine that it's cortic and hope to construct in a very we were never able to make that work. Right. Okay, thank you. So there's there's still a lot of things for all, all the rest of you to do. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's great. Okay. Can I just ask a very quick question? So um, you uh, you mentioned that um, you know that you've got different constructions of the magic square. Where you've, you know, you've got the division algebras with tensor division algebras, or split with split, or split with division um, the regular division algebras. Um, have you seen any other variations apart from those uh, on the magic square? Hello? No, oh, I'm going to say no to that. Barton and Sudbury gave what I would describe as the definitive treatment of the different real magic squares, both two by two and three by three. Um, that all that work is implicitly contained in earlier work, although they did the, they did a really nice job of describing it and extending much of it to the group level. Okay. All right. Uh, I think Tajinder has another question here. Uh, so just to start remark, Tavian, to complete our uh, previous uh, discussion, uh, that, uh, you know, if you use O tensor O prime, what I have, we, I like to think of it as these complex split bioctonions, you can actually make chiral fermions by, you know, left-handed with O and right-handed with O prime. So the, 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 the split octonions are very helpful in uh, giving chirality. And it's, uh, I'll say yes. Um, and, and that sounds like it's worth pursuing further. Um, the, the question of chirality is of, of great interest and, and that might be one way to approach it. Yeah, gender, I don't think that we can put that structure directly into E8 the way we are. So, you know, we've been kind of avoiding that. But I wanted to go back to something you said earlier. You talked about the fact that you had, you had this right left-handed symmetry and a mm -hmm. right-handed sterile neutrino. And I right. think that that we also have all of that. I think that those... Um, features are a feature of any SO10 theory, anything that takes the, the electroweak SO4 as a, rather than an SU2 left or an SU2 right. So we, of course, have that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you were to take what we do in E8 mm -hmm. and play whatever magic you do with the mm -hmm. SU2 right that's in E8, mm -hmm. um, or possibly the SU2 left. So the, the two SU2s, one of them is in G2, though for us, one's in G2 mm. and the other's not. So yes. they're structurally very different from each other mm -hmm. when you're thinking octonionically. Mm. And so I think you could look in E8 and do whatever magic you do with one of the SU2s mm. and, and pull out um, some of the results that you've been pulling out. And if you want to like, take one of those SU2s to build gravity. I mean, you're breaking the SO10 right. down to an SU5. And, yeah. and, and then my guess, my guess is that this, the E8 framework might give you another language to do, to do exactly the calculations you've been doing, but we have not done those calculations. Uh, so. I would love to do that. I want to understand how to relate E6 to E8 when I start doing the standard model. 
I, I have no feeling, but I'll see your papers, and try to learn this. So, so again, E6, E6. E6 is naturally like what you get if you take out color. Okay. And you'll okay. see it, you'll see in our paper that we spent a lot of time on E6 because the lepton sector lives in E6. Mm -hmm. So all of electroweak lives in E6. But if I complexify the E6, then I can probably get the color also there, no? We, but no. we can't. In The whole point is in this, this magic square construction, you can't just complexify mm -hmm, mm -hmm. any of the algebras. And so that's what okay. people always do. They complexify them, and then mm -hmm. they end up with like twice as many things as they need. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the the principle that Tevian articulated of keep the don't complexify outside of the Lie algebra, only complexify, use this complex structure on the spinners. Okay. Um, okay. It okay. is the okay. thing that we okay. do, I think, that's that's most different from what other people do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let me follow up on that. There has been a lot of work done recently. Um, a significant amount of it by, by Cole, taking the point of view that you tensor the division algebras together, okay? Yeah, yeah, I am her follower. <laughs> um, and we will confess that we don't, um, we, have, we have not worked out the details, and so don't fully understand all of the affordances of that approach, but we would not be at all surprised to discover significant commonalities and look forward to um, seeing some of those worked out. Me too. So the, the C tensor H, the difference between C tensor H and O prime is, is small. And so, so maybe the C small. tensor maybe H small. tensor O yeah. is, 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 it has to have a whole lot of overlap with what we do, but of course, the exact notation that you do it in and the sign, the the places that the signs come back to bite you, those those differences are um, prob uh, cause problem. <laughs> I mean, are, are are the are the sign problems that we've all been tearing our hair out uh, for for decades with, and so we think we're going to have to actually sit down with Cole and say we do this and you do that and like like try and figure them out in parallel um to to see where where insights that she has from looking at that very different structure very different that slightly different structure um might give us insights in in e8 and vice versa no um, good in one related thing which concerns me i like to think of octonions as giving me a coordinate geometry to replace, say, R4. And then I like to ask, how would I do quantum theory on an octonionic space? And it concerns me a bit that the rest of the community, which is working with octonions and the standard model, somehow is not saying anything about quantum field theory as if we would go ahead the way we always used to. But uh, there's something new here. I mean, uh, what do I use octonions for? They are a new kind of coordinate geometry and I have to figure out how to write quantum theory on this rather than R4 with a Lorentzian metric. So I think all I will say is that um, we've been feeling for years that we ourselves were, were blind men exploring the elephant. And that then when we looked at things, you know, this particular octonionic or division algebra structure in this way, we were seeing these kinds of things. And when we were looking at it from some other direction, and then when we read what other people were doing, they were also looking at different parts of the elephant. And I mean, you can put twos and threes and fours fit into the structure in many different ways. And what we've all been looking for is, um, it is like how to put the whole elephant together. I agree. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, what, is, what does the elephant look like? And we're, we're, I guess we're trying to suggest to all of you that, that the elephant may look like E8. 
Yeah, but then I want to do quantum field theory on a space time whose symmetry is E8. We, I don't think that anything that we've done addresses whether or not you can do what you're that thing that you're trying to do. I think things that Rob is doing, it may be closer to that. Hmm. But. Um, all, right. all right, so uh, thank you again, uh, Tevin and Corinne for uh, for such a great talk. And you know, especially everybody had really great questions today. And, um, and uh, so I'm very happy for this. Um, now, of course, in two weeks time, uh, we're gonna have Corinne and Tevin speaking, us, uh, speaking with us again. And they're gonna be telling us, of course, as you know about their new model, which will relate the standard model to E8. Um, so please remember though, um, that uh, we're going, they're going to be presenting again at an earlier time. So this is uh, 5 p.m. Berlin time. Um, normally we do it at 6 p.m., but uh, um, we're- that, That's for me, I teach. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. So, so again, uh, uh, so we hope to see you again in two weeks at 5 p.m. Berlin time. Thank you, Cole.